Good evening, Faith Life Church Northwest. Let's stand and welcome the presence of the Lord in this house. <laughs> Holy Spirit, <laughs> we give you preeminence in this place. Lord, you are good all the time. And Lord, we thank you that you desire to touch your people more than we desire to be touched. And we are hungry. We are thirsty. Yes. We are desperate for you. So we say, come, Holy Spirit, and come do whatever you want to do. Lord, we thank you for a strong anointing in this house tonight. We thank you that we shall leave changed and different than we came in in Jesus' name. So Lord, accept the praises of your people now. We love you. We magnify you. We glorify you. We give you the highest praise for you are so worthy of it. We honor you this night and we call you King of Kings and Lord of Lords, yes. but more importantly, our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords. We bow our knee to you. We submit to you, Lord. So come, Captain of the church, Captain of the hosts and head of the church and do what you want to do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Let's worship. Lord, our hearts cry is exactly that this night, not to just sing it to you in a form of a song, but a prayer from our heart, Holy Spirit, precious Holy Spirit, we reverence you. We acknowledge that without you, we have nothing. Come and do what you want to do and take complete control. Lord, we don't even want that kind of control for we can't fill your people, we can't heal your people, we can't give your people wisdom, refresh them, but oh, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come by your power, come by your gifts, come by your anointing, come by the fruit of the Spirit, come by your precious presence, come in your glory, come and manifest a big God to us any way that you want to do it and help us to get out of your way so that you can do it. Welcome, Holy Spirit, into this church. Welcome into our lives. Welcome into our families. Welcome into our hearts and our plans. Welcome into our future. Welcome in every way. For Lord, unless you build the house, we will build it, build it in vain. So Holy Spirit, you are that. We have tasted. You are the never dry fountain. We can come and come and come and come and come again. Lord, you are the one who refreshes. You are the one that causes those rivers to bubble up on the inside of us so that we can give out your goodness to one another and to a lost and dying world. Holy Spirit, there is nothing like drinking of your waters. There is nothing like drinking of your sweet new wine. There is nothing like partaking at your table of your goodness and your glory and your healing. There is nothing like your mercy and your grace. There is nothing like having our hearts transformed and just waiting on you and loving on you and hearing you and responding to you and yielding to you. How we love you, how we reverence you. Hallelujah. Lord, come with your joy. Come with your power. Come with your glory. Come with your sweetness. Come with your conviction. Come with your encouragement. Come, Lord, with your direction. Come any way you want to come. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, we love you. We appreciate you. Sandolovo prosha greski. Besen vresa meso bresko. Shroko ravam braskandere me ceble. Brava masom breske. Musom breske. Breve me se greshe gre. I hear the word of the Lord saying, you don't have to wait for those special moments, for those big meetings, for a lot of people, for a special worship leader, for a special preacher. You can learn to drink.
from my water day and night, anytime going down the road at home. You can learn to drink of my presence. And I have so much in store for you. If you only knew, I'm not an occasional God. I'm not an, a, a once a year special touch kind of God. I'm not the kind of God who says when you strive hard enough and long enough, once a year you can taste of me that way. I'm a God who wants to fill you and thrill you and anoint you and use you and show you and talk to you and let you listen to and put your head in my chest and hear my heart beat. I'm a God that wants to be intimate with you, that wants to rain on you, that wants to shower you, that wants to bless you, that wants to rise up big on the inside of you, that wants your legs and your arms and your feet and your mouth and your eyes and your ears to be used for my glory. When you are filled with me and you're not aware of you and not aware of the natural circumstances of this earth, but even as you sang earlier, when you exalt the, the big one, when you exalt the mighty one, when you look far above this realm, that's where you begin to drink and to see and to know and to experience my goodness. And then when you walk on this earth, you're able to d dispense of that goodness everywhere you go. So come and drink, come and drink, come and eat, come and taste come and sample, come and desire more, come and tell you are content, come and tell you hunger no more, and then get hungry again, and I'll do it again, and get thirsty again, and I'll do it again, come and let me fill you, come and let me fill you, come and let me fill you, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I want to take my word and explode it on the inside of you. I can take that word that is written or even that word that you audibly hear and explode it on the inside of you until you see what others do not see and hear what others do not hear and know in your heart what others do not know. And when it becomes that real to you, you walk in it, you talk in it, you live in it. Yes. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If anybody else has something, go ahead and bring it forth. Jesus. 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 Jesus, we won't get in a hurry for your presence and your sweetness. We don't even want to move from it. Hallelujah. Welcome, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Have your way in our lives, Holy Spirit and Word of God. Do what only you can do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We went to visit Sonny and Harold today. They send their love, and they want everyone in the church to know how much that they miss us, and we're believing for them to be back in no time. I tell you, I walked out of, I, I walked out of their apartment today different than I have before. 
I don't know if anybody else needed that message today, but I needed that message today. I tell you what, that is working deep on the inside of me. And I believe that's good. I believe that's just begun. I walked out of there going, this is a done deal. Not, oh, God, we're hanging on to your promises. We're in a... No, this is a done deal. This is a done deal. Hallelujah. 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 Good to see Jackie out with us tonight. The word is already working mightily. Hallelujah. And Jennifer told me the kids are better. She said she told uh, Grace, she said, uh, uh, Grandma Debbie felt led to call me out and pray for me for you today, Grace. And she said, well, it looks like it worked. <laughs> I love it. Out of the mouths of babes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Is it all right, Jackie, to tell what you told at the beginning of the service, you think? Or? Jackie just shared with me because she thought I'd be blessed by it, and I sure was blessed by it. The, the young man that you guys bring, uh, what is his name? Gabe. That he told her today that last week's lesson so impacted him. He said, I want you to know I'm, I wrote a paper about it in school, and I got an A-plus on it, on Lazarus. And, and uh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and it must have been a good paper to get an A plus on it. So, so I told her everything I hear coming out from back there is nothing but blessing and good. And, and I know it's a lot of work for a, a lady who's trying to remodel her house and do a lot of other things. And I'm so thankful you stepped up to the plate like that, Jackie. He's using you. And, if we, and he just said that. He wants to use our hands, our feet, our mouthpiece, anywhere we will lend ourselves available to him. God is good all the time. Amen? Amen. Amen. I don't think we have to redo this morning's announcements. And um, I just want to get to introducing Taylor. Obviously, most of the times Taylor speaks here or most anybody else. I'm not here to introduce them. <laughs> and uh, So this is kind of fun tonight. And uh, those of you watching by way of online... Um, you know, we're, we're just so happy that Taylor's a part of this church and has been a part of our lives for so many years. And of course, my husband was his pastor for so many years, and uh, I was the evangelist that came in and, and got to see this, this boy growing up in the things of God every year as I would come back. And, and now to, to get to be a part even on more of a full-time basis of, of us both getting to nurture him as well as his parents and watch the call of God develop in his life, nothing could make me happier. It's, it's just like what I say when I teach in Bible schools, to see it being reproduced out there and knowing that it's going to go past where, where we ever went someday is the most thrilling thing. That must be what Jesus felt when he looked at his disciples, although there was other times he's just like... <laughs> How long must I be with you? <laughs> What's wrong with you? But, but there are other times he went, no, I see the end from the beginning. I'm going to get something out of this. And, and, uh, but I can imagine as he looked down after he ascended to the Father and uh, after the day of Pentecost when he saw Peter, who, who the last time he had looked at him, you know, was just was just denying him and cussing. And then, and then I mean, I've never even seen it like that. It just came to me as, as in this introduction that Jesus had to look out over the banister, or from the throne, I should say, and, and at, at the day of Pentecost and go, you go, Peter. You go, Peter. I always knew that was in you. Yeah. At the birth of the church, you go, Peter. But um, anyway, we're so happy with the, with the call of God on Taylor's life, and not only with the call of God, but for his every everything about him you don't find too many 16 year olds disrespectful not disrespectful i said this i thought i better enunciate that online uh this respectful and polite and and just a delight to be around not to mention the kind of excellent student he is we announced this morning or had him announce that he just got first place and the regional history uh, paper that he wrote, and now is going to state, and maybe on to D.C. here, and and um, and just, I mean, there's more and more we could say, but uh, I just have been preaching a lot on pride, so I better stop here. But uh, but uh, we're delighted in what God is doing in this young man, and so take your liberty tonight, young man of God, and uh, we're going to believe for the Holy Ghost to do great things. Come. <laughs> Yes. Oh, thank you. Yes, got so caught up in everything else here. Thank you. Yes, let's receive the tithe and offering here first. 
<laughs> thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you ahead of time for what you're about to do in this offering, what you're doing through this congregation. We thank you for the multiplication, not only for the work of the ministry that's even helped to send us right now this week to France and to Switzerland. It's going around the world by way of live stream. Lord, you've done so much. And Lord, we're believing for even more in the days to come because you're the great multiplier and you meet every need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord, you know? Um, yeah. You know, Miss Jack, you know, I can just imagine Miss Jackie here. She's, you know, she was given out, given out, given out. You know, I heard. Um, I think it was, you know, I can remember, either, I think you were an evangelist back then, but I, you, you were preaching one time about, you know, how you're giving out. I think you were speaking about pre preaching and uh, speaking in tongues, and you're talking about how um, after, especially after you give out, then you got to get back in yeah. and build yourself back up. Yeah. And uh, don't worry, Pastor, I still remember you talking about sinking your pick. But, <laughs> uh, but you know what? So, so Miss Jackie, she's giving out on Sundays, then she's got to settle for, oh, Taylor's preaching, oh, great, but... Oh, well, you know, I believe, uh, I believe that um, he's spoken, if I can find my electronic notes. Uh, well, God is good. And one thing that uh, Pastor Abby forgot to say was that tonight after the service, we're having a dessert celebration for our, our pastor's birthday. Like she said, it's not every day she gets to celebrate her 29th birthday. So <laughs> we're going to have a great time tonight in fellowship. Mm. Uh, so I'd like, I'd like to open in prayer for, my, uh, for the sermon. Father, we come to you right now in the name of your son, Jesus, praying for this word. I believe you've given it to me so that I could give it to others. And I pray, Lord, I only pray that there will be less of me tonight than ever before and more of you tonight than ever before. Use my mouth. Use all of me to speak your word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Yeah, but you know, before, actually, before I get into this, you know, I don't want to seem like Joel Osteen starting with something funny, but <laughs> I don't, but uh, yeah, anyway, but uh, tonight, um, so this morning, you know, Pastor Bob, Pastor Debbie asked me to put that on the sign, you know, that a teenager was speaking, and so I was telling, and so the shepherds say, so you're speaking tonight, because they said, you know, they saw it on the sign, and I said, yeah, and then he's like, yeah, how'd you know, so I said, how'd you know it was me, they said, well, you're the only teenager we know that can't, <laughs> that you're the only teenager we know that, that, we, that can't stop talking. So, <laughs> oh, mm. there's a hmm. one of my one song that I love greatly. It's called Surrender. It says, "I'm giving you my heart and all that is within. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my, my King. I'm giving you my dreams. I'm laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life." In churches today, many times, not in this church, but in the church in general, especially in America, we love to talk about the promise of new life, the promise of grace, but so many times we hyperize that part and forsake the part that comes before. The whole purpose of that song is talking about surrender. Amen. Before we can come, we must surrender. And so many of the, so many of the best songs talk about surrendering and laying ourselves down for more of him. Because when we stand in the way of God, he can't do much. And so I would like to open with Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1. And in the Amplified, I love the Amplified in this one especially. So it says, while you're turning there, I'll start reading. It says, wait and listen. Everyone who is thirsty, come waters. He who has no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy priceless spiritual wine and milk without honey, without price. Simply, it says in the Amplified, for the self-surrender that accepts the blessing. Amen. Pastor Debbie has been having an awesome series on hunger and thirst. And you know what? We must be hungry. That's the thing. Come. It says, come on, everybody. Come and listen. Come. What did Jesus say on the last day of the feast? He said, come all who thirst. Yes. You come unto me. All you are. He says, come on, come and drink. I love in the, my, one of my favorite um, Bible movies. I think it is my favorite Bible movie is the Gospel of John. And I love because it just portrays. The, Jesus' life through such a precious, not just a great teacher, not just, but through the eyes of the man that Jesus loved, who the man who leaned on the heart of Jesus. And 
just reading that, and I so many times love watching the part where um, the where the Samaritan woman at the well is talking with Jesus. And the way that's acting, if you're going to get any Christian movie, I'd suggest that one is an awesome one to start with. But she is just such an awesome portrayal and how he says, you know, this fills who drink this water will get thirsty again. Yeah. Later on in Isaiah, in this same chapter, he says, why do you spend your money on what does not satisfy? Why do you buy what does not, what does not fill, what does not come in? People in this world are spending themselves their priceless souls on things which do not satisfy. They seek the bottle. They seek, they can seek anything in their in life that's of this world and it does not satisfy and they keep on spending themselves until they're so much in debt because when you, our souls are already, when we're not with Christ, when we don't accept his redemption, we are bought, we are owned by the God of this world and without his redemption, they're just spending themselves, spending themselves and then by the time they die, the, it comes to a debt that all men pay, and without Christ, they cannot redeem themselves. They find themselves in a debt which could never be repaid on our own means, and because if we do not set ourselves to seek God, if we do not show others that there is something that does satisfy, there is something that does fill to the very core of man, there is something that can fill and satisfy and penetrate and saturate to our very inner souls if we do not show them, they're going to keep spending themselves on stuff that will lead them straight to the gates of hell. Yeah, yeah. And so, I might not get to my sermon, but in, in Proverbs, one of my favorite Proverbs, it says, to the man that is hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. But to the man that is full, the man that is full loathes the honeycomb. There's so much power in that one proverb. He who is, who is full loathes the honeycomb. I don't want to ever be full because his presence is so sweet. It drips like the honey. Honey back in those days, they didn't have Tillamook mudslide back then. If they had Tillamook, he would have been talking talking about Tillamook, but back then it was honey, you're talking about, he talks about honey, the man that is hungry, he's talking, honey was so sweet, it's so rich, it satisfies, it soothes, and the man that is hungry will take anything, but the man that is full will loathe the honeycomb. Yes. Oh, there's so much, you can go deep into that. Let us never loathe the honeycomb. If this word becomes commonplace, if this gospel becomes regular, if his presence becomes usual, if his glory becomes natural, we have lost all that we are in Christ. We must never be full. He has offered us to come to the table. He says, come and listen, drink all you can. Come and get another taste. He says, come and drink. But the moment we say, I'm not getting any more, that is an offense and a slap in his face. God wants to come and he wants to touch. He wants to saturate. He wants to sow. Charles Spurgeon always comes to him. And always come to you, God, but you know. Oh, uh, he, he says, you know what? He says in one of his devotionals, he said, you know, I used to think that I could be like the woman at the well and be satisfied with a crumb, and I thought I'd be so humble. This is my paraphrase. He'd say, he said it much more eloquently than that. But he said, I thought I could be satisfied with just a little, just a little crumb, just like, this, just like this Phoenician woman. But then I realized, wait a second, I'm a son. I don't need to be content with a crumb. I can have the full loaf. I can get the cake a piece. I can get all that. I can have full access to the entire table. Yeah. And the moment we go back from tasting the cake to the crumb, it's an offense. Yes, it is. It's an yeah. offense. We sit here and such powerful word comes from that pulpit from our awesome pastors. And if we sit here, <laughs> you know, Pastor Debbie, I didn't eat breakfast. I never eat breakfast on Sundays and I'm getting pretty hungry. The moment we do that, it's saying at the dinner table, I'm full. I don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. Let us always
least try to be, to listen to each and every message and say, no matter how idiotic the person might be, I'm getting something out of this. You know what? No. <laughs> That's it. <enough. laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> right now so no matter how okay I love you so much I love you too okay I was thinking but many of you probably don't know this but Charles Spurgeon actually the night he got saved he walked it was a snowy wintry night and he walked into a church and the man who was speaking wasn't a pastor. Charles Spurgeon, quite frankly, said that basically the guy didn't really know his Bible. He was stuttering and mumbling. But the Spirit of God came upon him. And the man in the pulpit looked directly at Mr. Spurgeon, a young 15 or 14-year-old Mr. Spurgeon, I believe he was 15, and said, you know what, you kind of look very miserable. You need to release your burden. God can use anybody. And out of anybody, he can use the someone as elo eloquent as Mr. Spurgeon, as powerful as our pastors, or as we, or as unrecognized as me, he can use anybody. And we need to come here and say, no matter what, I believe that I can get something out of it. And we need to be yeah. desperate for yeah. each yeah. bite, each, I don't know about you, but just back to the Tillamook ice cream. When I take a bite, I scoop and I, and I try to get, and when I'm alone, I lick the bowl and I try to get every single bite that I can because it's so good. How much more for the most valuable substance yes. in the universe? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh. Mm, Mr. Spurgeon says, quote, all is provided that a man may need to quench his soul's thirst. To his conscience, the atonement brings peace. To his understanding, the gospel brings the richest instruction. To his heart, the person of Jesus is the noblest of, of object of affection. To the whole man, the truth as it is in Jesus supplies the purest nourishment. Thirst is terrible, but Jesus can remove it. Though the soul were utterly famished, Jesus could restore it. Yes. And he has this available to us all the time, all the time. And he's, that's why he says, come, come, come and drink, come and receive, come and receive, come and eat, come to the table, come and eat, come, come. But like it says in the Amplified, simply for the self-surrender that accepts the blessing. Yeah. It's awesome, and we got this awesome sermon, this stuff that comes out and penetrates our lives, but there's a cost. Yes. Salvation is a free gift, but let me, let me tell you, it will cost us everything to keep that gift. Yes. Someone gives you a car for free, it's a free car. But how many of you know, you got to pay to keep gasoline in that car. you got to pay to maintain that car. You know what? How much more for salvation when it's the most fragile thing where the slightest move away, the slightest sin could put a dent in that station. The slightest offense to the Holy Ghost could quench, could remove, could grieve the Spirit. We must be so careful that we heed to the straight, the narrow, the precise, the pure water of the Word yes. and surrender our all. Yes. Yes. Many times in the Bible, it talks about surrender. And how we must yield to whatever he wants in any circumstance. And there's an example of a man who was a very powerful man in the Bible. He's taught about so many times, has an excellent example about the power of God. And in many kids' movies, is portrayed as this awesome guy, always humble. But I was doing some studying, I remember this from preaching a long time ago, long, long time ago, about Gideon, a man who was so, we know the story to go over it. The story is found in Judges chapter 6 through chapter 8, and uh, here's a part that I'm going to be focusing on. We won't read it verse for verse, but I'll give you a summary in the time 
of Gideon, the, Mid the Israelites had forsaken the Lord God, and the Midianites were oppressing the children of Israel. And after a while, they cried out. They cried out to God for freedom. And so God looked, and he found Gideon. Yes. And so he went, and the angel of the Lord said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. God will recognize you before you even recognize yeah. you. Yes. God can find you. He can see who you are, who you are in Christ. He can see what you can do through him before you, if anybody has an idea yes. about what you can do. Mm. <clears throat> and so Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord, this is verse 13, but you don't need, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Yes. And why is it, and where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, How, I mean, if I was Gideon and an angel of the Lord appeared, I would not be sassing off God, no. God's angel. No. No. So we see here that Gideon could really use a trip to Ramah. So he could really, he could really use something, right? And so he's there. And so we see him. Basically, let me put it to you this way. He has no faith. He's basically a coward. He's afraid of his father's house. When he says, you know, go destroy the um, altar to Baal, he does it. He's so afraid he's going to go do it at night, you know, so everybody keeps it hidden and so in the morning they were going to kill him but then his dad kind of stepped in for him but basically throughout all of judges chapter six he, Gideon's kind of going around tiptoeing around, okay, I want the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry. Oh, uh-oh. Um, I want the ground to be wet and the fleece to be dry. I want it, or vice versa. You know, I want this. You know what? We see here a man that is very low, very willing to, okay, you know, I need some size. He, he, he's not very high, and at his least, he considers himself so low, and God chose him to use him, and God saw the potential in him. And in Judges chapter 7, God starts using him, and I would like to focus how many times God told, you know, okay, you have 10,000. No, I want you to short it, you know, make it less. Make it less. You have to, no, I want it, make it less. I want less. I, he's focusing that people may know that I have done this, that yes. people may know that I have done this. Yes. I don't know, make it smaller. I don't want any man to boast. I want them to know that I have done this. Amen. God is not proud. He is worthy of all that. Yes. And he, he's keeping, he's like, you know, some people that don't understand the Bible, you look at anything, and they're like, oh, yeah, God's a cruel, lucky. No, have you seen it from his perspective? He's so just, so holy. Read his word, and you'll find out his reasons. All, everything God does is just and pure. Right. And right now, he's just wanting to make sure that no man may boast. Because yeah. the moment they boast, and I have another Spurgeon quote for that a little bit later, but the moment they boast, they set themselves up as rivals, and God is a very jealous God. Yes, he is. And he's not angry. It's not, well, he can get angry. And, but when it turns to this, it's not as if, you know, it's mine. He's not a jealous as, as we think. He's not an envious. But when he has his bride, his, and we are the bride of Christ, and when he sees his bride flirting with the world, he becomes very jealous, yes. very zealous for his bride because he paid a lot. He bled. He died. He became sin for that bride, not in this story but for us in the modern church and he's very jealous for our love and where we spend our time so he's very jealous in the old testament for his glory to be made sure to be made known so we know the story it goes down gets down to three gideon and the 300 they go um, they go out and attack the Midianites, have the fire and the pitchers, and then they confuse all the Midianites. They go out, and they even hear that somebody in the Midianite camp had a dream, and they said a big loaf of bread came and flattened us out, and it's Israel. You know, <laughs> in other words, the God of Israel is on their side. They said, hey, look, the God of Israel. It seems like God has said so much time. It's like... You'd have to be, hello, you could have had a V8. Yeah. Come on, he'd say, it's all God here. What are you missing? So we see here, and it's all God. Gideon's doing everything God says. And so everybody has all... Um, has all heard the victory. They go out. The Midianites are so confused. They start fighting against each other. Huge victory for um, Gideon. But I'd like to say that most every single story stops there in chapter 7. 
most, there's a Veggie Tales Gideon, and in the end, I like to say, you know, it, it shows Gideon, and he's getting a, Larry, Gideon played by Larry the Cucumber, um, and so he's getting a parade, and then they hear these people on the news, news, you know, Veggie Tales, you know, it, it, <laughs> homeschoolers explain Veggie Tales logic, if any of you are watching, but anyway, um, so anyway, then, then, Larry or Gideon comes out and says, no, it was all God. Let me tell you what really happened. I didn't do it. But that's not the man Gideon became. Amen. I would like to come and continue and tell you the story of a man, Gideon, we've been reading about, whom God used mightily, but something happened in his heart. And this thing that happened was a seed of pride. And this root, this pride, this was the very first sin. It was the very first seed of wickedness. And almost every single person in the Bible, from the mightiest of kings to the lowest of men in the, that we see in the Bible, we see in this day and age, has somehow fallen to pride. My favorite, besides David, you know what? My favorite king in the entire, almost my favorite Bible character, besides Jesus, of course, my favorite Bible character is Hezekiah. I love his heart. I love his heart for God. And he says, and even it, the Bible even says that besides after David, he was the best king of Israel. There's no, no question. He was the best. The Bible says he was the best and so and, and but even Hezekiah walked out one day and God found pride in his heart if it can happen to the humblest and the and the most spirit led of men how are we going to say but no God I'm special you know I you know we must be so careful to see that what happened to Gideon what happened to Hezekiah Hezekiah repented Gideon did not so many men did not repent we must make sure that we do repent or else we will become like Gideon as we shall see so chapter 8, it's a lot of, after Gideon went and attacked the Midianites, the kings weren't there. So there were three other kings in Midian that they had to go out and fight. And so basically chapter 8 is a whole tale of all the Israelites' um, plight for um, get, slaughtering and um, getting rid of all the rest of the Midianites. And, but I would like to point out that in chapter 8, Gideon does not one time Ask the Lord what he wants him to do. Not once. Not once. And I'd like to start in chapter 8. So basically the first few verses, the children of Ephraim and the children of Ephraim, they're like the mighty warriors in Israel. They're, they're the tough guys. They're the ones that just lust. If you watch Star Trek, they're the Klingons. They want to, they want to come and they want to fight and they're going and they say, Gideon, why didn't you call us up to go fight with you? We want in on the glory. They didn't say that, but you know, that's what we're seeing. And so what does Gideon need to say? Gideon needs to say, shh. You shut your mouth right now. It wasn't me. It was God. And if God wanted you, frankly, he would have invited you. <laughs> but what does Gideon say? And then Gideon said, what have I done, I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the graves of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? Ab the names aren't important. I'm sorry. God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, Zeb. And what have I? What was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him was subsided when he said that. Gideon did not give glory to God in any way. He said, "What have I done?" He's recognizing Gideon is looking at himself and saying, "These works I did." Yeah. He's saying, "I did these works." Right. I did this work. I conquered, but what have I done in comparison with you? And so there, it, he puffed up himself, and he puffed up, and he puffed up Ephraim. How, Ephraim, how many know that not always a soft answer turns away wrath? Wrath, but a soft answer isn't always the right answer. There's a time to there's a time to exhort, but there's a by George, there's a time to rebuke. There's a time, that, and Gideon should have rebuked. But instead, he tried to soothe with man's reasoning, man's logic. Tried to puff them up, make them feel good. You, he who puffs up his friend sets a snare for him. Right. And that's exactly what Gideon did. 
still going on. Gideon is 300, is still pursuing the, the kings of Midian. And then one, and then they get to a town. Gideon's men are very hungry. They say, men of uh, this uh, town, they say, give us some bread, give us provisions. They say, no, they were being bad. They were, they could use to go to Ramah too. And they said, they said, no, because if you lose, then the kings of Midian will take their revenge on us if we help you. And so Gideon goes on and he's not very he's not very happy as Jesse Duplantis would say he had a fit of carnality uh, but anyway he goes on and he goes on and he attacks the kings the kings of Midian and in this process I'm just summarizing but he finds out that the kings of Midian had killed his brothers now that is for anybody that's a very sad that would be a very sad thing to happen but in bible days especially there are very um precise methods of ve vengeance yeah. and the way that gideon replied to the knowledge of his brother's murder was he replied and he took out vengeance in a way like the the murder of his brothers were the assassin assassinations of princes he's not acting like they just killed his brothers they were acting like they he, they killed royalty we'll get to that in a second but then he goes on, and then he goes back, he defeats all the Midianites, and then he goes back to that town that didn't burn bread, and he took, and he literally tortured all the men of the town, took big bu thorn bushes and scraped their skin, horrible torture that in Bible days only kings would punish their subjects with. He's acting like many scholars comment that he's acting like a king and a very harsh king. And we see later on in, um, we start in uh, verse 22, after all that was done, the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hands of Midian. First of all, we see here that they are seeing. They're not saying God has delivered us and he used you. Right. They're saying you have delivered us. That mean, tells me that Gideon's actions, everything that he does and says, have been showing, like we've seen, showing that, see, I did this. I did this. And they say, so you rule over us because you did that. And what does Gideon say? I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And bless God, what an awesome assembly of God saying, wasn't that? <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. You know, but I want to say, I say that because, you know, sometimes we get these religious, you know, what we can do, this is the best answer. This is what, this is the right thing to do, you know, refuse. But then Gideon doesn't just leave it there, nor does he say, no, God delivered you. What does he say he says I would like to make a request of you that each of you give me the earrings from his plunder for they had golden earrings for their Ishmaelites and they, so they answered oh we'll gladly give them so from all the sp spoil they had each and every it was a custom of the Ishmaelites for them to wear these golden each person to wear some golden earrings and so Gideon makes a request give me the golden earrings and so they put out a big blanket basically they put out a garment and each man threw his, its earnings and now and they all these gold earrings now the weight of the gold that was requested was 1,700 shekels of gold I did a calculation that'd be worth about 1.3 million dollars in this day and age 1.3 million dollars and then it says besides the crescent ornaments pendants and purple robes which are on the kings of Midian and besides the chains are on the camel's neck so in other words there was lots of other plunder but Gideon just asked give, just give me the earrings I'll just I'll be happy you know what I'll just take the earrings I'll just take the earrings there. I'm not asking for everything. I'm not asking for these awesome things that were the chains around the camel's necks. I'm not asking for all the robes. I'm not asking for any else of the plunder. Just give me an earring. And then what happens? It says, then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his city. And what is an ephod? An ephod was a garment that the priests would wear. The regular priests, they wore a linen ephod, and the high priest wore a decorated ephod. But Gideon made a golden ephod. He made it, and especially in Bible days, in Old Testament especially, everything is very symbolic. 
Gold usually represents royalty or dignity or glory. And Gideon makes a golden ephod that was only supposed to be used for the priests. He makes one of gold. And what happens? And all Israel played the harlot with it there. They worshipped the eth, the golden ephod, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Yes. And before we go on to talk about that, another thing about Gideon, he named one of his sons Abimelech. I'm not saying, you know what, that nowadays we don't know, you know, it's, you know that, that might not mean much today, but back in the Bible days, names were carefully and precisely chosen. And one of Gideon's sons was named Abimelech. And what does the name Abimelech mean? Abimelech means literally, my father is king. Or my father, the king. So Gideon lives his life. He doesn't accept the physical leadership, the physical title of being king, but he lives his life. He lives his, in his heart. He's setting himself up like a king and the leader of Israel, and his earrings added up pretty quickly. What, we ha what I'd like to say, many times in our lives, we have an earring in our life which we will not surrender. Many times, you know, the great sculptors, they have to chisel away from whatever material they're carving. They have to chisel and chisel and whatever, whatever they're making. Think of Michelangelo working on his David and he's chiseling and chiseling and chiseling. What if the statue said, no, nope, I'm not going to let you chisel off that part. Sometimes God, God is always working on us yeah. and will always have something on us that he has to chisel off. Yeah. There's always something. That's a fact yeah. of being here on the earth. Yeah. And, but the fact is, he's always chiseling. Yeah. That's, that's, the, yeah. that's the point. So he's always chiseling. He's like, oh, yeah, God, burn that up. Oh, God, yes, burn that up. But oh, no, not that. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, God, no, not this is, mm -mm, this is my, it, might, it can be anything. Anything, it can draw back. God, everything. Oh, but I don't want to tithe. Oh, God, everything, everything. Oh, but I don't want to go to church all the time. I don't want to have to every Sunday. You know, I think whenever I feel like it would be more, I don't want to sacrifice all my time for that. Maybe it would be, um, oh, God, but I love that movie. Oh, I love that movie so much, but it uses your name in vain like 20 times. But, oh, I love that. Mmm, can't go. Indiana Jones or God? Indiana Jones or God? Oh, God, it's so hard. Sometimes we have these areas in our lives that we don't want to yield or surrender. Amen. And those, and what was the price to come to the table? Nothing but the self-surrender. And when we draw back, when we keep an earring, as you saw in Gideon, earrings have a way of piling up, and we might have something, but the moment we say, no, nope, not there, because unlike um, statues, we have the ability to draw back. Yes. We do. And the moment we say, God, don't take this part. God, I don't want to do this. God, your word says this, but I love this habit of sin so much. It's been, it tells me that that person has not had a true nature change. Yeah. Anybody, almost anybody can tell you that when they come to Christ, they come to Christ and it's boom. My dad says so many times about how he, when he was saved, it's like he, nobody needed to tell him. He didn't need to come to CPNC and have pastor talking all about, all about the old ways and how he needs to give that stuff up. He knew, and pastor did teach those things, but he knew that he had to give up all this old junk from his old life because why? He had a nature change. And today in age, we don't have a nature change when we become Christians. We have a religious preference on Facebook change. <laughs> we change from undecided, agnostic, and we change into Christian. And that's as far as it goes. Yeah. Yeah. We see people that become Christian. You know, Jason and Hannah uh, up in Bremerton were talking about how they had somebody that wanted to serve with the kids, but they'd look on their Facebook and they were drinking, they were partying, and they had no nature change. Right. Do you think God's saying, I, I want to be a mean daddy, so let's see what I can. Let's see what I can uh, make sure that you don't look at that's your favorite movie. I'm going to make sure that you cannot watch that favorite movie. No, he's saying, I love you so much, yeah. and I want to hug you and give you so much. I want to pour my anointing 
on you so much. I want to be and dwell on the inside of you so much, but I can't because you're holding on to something that is opposite of my nature. Yes, that's right. The moment we hold on, the moment we set aside something, a little something, a little something that we hold on to, it becomes that earring. And at first it's just one, but that one leads to another, and another is thrown into the pile, and then another concession, then another compromise, and then you're drawing back a little bit more. You used to be on fire. We used to be stirred over here. We used to be more God, and then something happens. He works on life. Then we throw an earring into the pile, and we draw back. We throw an earring to the pile, and we draw back. We throw an earring into the pile, and we draw back. Little compromises, little compromises. Mr. Spurgeon says a little thorn may cause much suffering. A little cloud may hide the sun. Little foxes spoil the vines. And little sins do mischief in the tender heart. Right. These little sins burrow deep into the soul and make it so full of that which is hateful to Christ that he will hold no comfortable fellowship and communion with us. The moment we stop surrendering, the moment we stop yielding, the moment we say, God, I know I'm right and I'm not changing. This could be in anything. This could be in doctrine. It could be in our theology. I believe this all my life, but I'm not conceding to this fact because it's been so ingrained in me. That's why he says, what was Pastor Debbie talking about that? Our way our brain works, the way our brain works, the more we think about something, the more it becomes part of our very nature. The more we think about something or meditate on something, the more it becomes a part, it's our habit. It becomes a habit. And the more we think about something, the more we hold on to something of this earth, the more we hold, longer we hold on to it, the more it becomes infused into our nature and the more... That becomes our nature is the moment we forsake his nature. Yeah. Matthew chapter 22 tells the story of the wedding feast. And he said, the king said, go out, tell everybody, everybody's invited. I mean, well, not at first. At first he said, sent, invited. The people that were invited didn't come. He sent out an invitation again. They said they murdered his servants. They murdered the prophets that he sent out. And then he said, you know what? Go and burn their cities. Say everybody can come. Everybody can come. Yeah. Now the custom in those days, because how I many know that's the king's court. You're not going to your local politician. You're not going to, you're not just going. Every time we do anything to God, whether it's through for the church or for anything, we're not just doing it for our pastors. We're not just doing it so we look good. We're doing it for the king. They're getting ready to attend. And Matthew chapter 22 tells a story about how the people, they're getting ready to see the king. But these people... Anybody in the whole kingdom, there's a lot of poor people in the kingdom, right? There's a lot of poor people that can't afford, and the custom in those days was for everybody to attend a wedding in a clean linen, white, um, a linen garment. And so the custom in those days is if you, if you didn't, couldn't afford a clean linen garment, whoever invited you would provide for that garment. So, in other words, if every invitation came a white, clean robe. And so all the poor people of this land were able to be able to receive this white, clean garment. They were able to receive these wedding clothes free of charge. Wait and listen. And it was three. Come, pay nothing. Come, come and drink. And he gives us, and he says, come, I'll even provide the righteousness. I'll even provide the means so you can stand before me. Amen. Because before, without God, our best is filthy rags. Right. Our best is filthy rags. And so we come and everybody has the ability. We can all come. And so it's the day of the wedding. It's the day of the wedding. We are portrayed in so many ways in the Bible. We're portrayed as the guests, and we're also portrayed in the bride in this instance. But I'm focusing on the guests. The guests were all in there. Everybody was white and clean. And then all of a sudden they saw somebody that was not wearing a wedding garment. Right. He had a wedding garment available for him. Yes. He was able to enjoy that person could have put on all of the clean righteousness and put on that linen garment for himself yes. and could have tasted of that glory, that clean righteousness, yes. but he didn't. That's right. Why not? We might think, yeah, why not? 
How many of you know that if you're gonna, if you get up in one day, especially I know that our, uh, that uh, Gracie and Nolan were in here, they could definitely relate. Hi, uh, if Gracie and Nolan were here, you're, you know, if you're in old, you know, kind of old, you know, not not really already dirty, but you know, old, you know, not really valuable clothes. You can go. Your parents can let you jump in a mud puddle if you're wearing old shoes. You know, you can get out there. If you're saying, hey, buddy, you wanna go? You go. Let's let play a little round of football before. You know, you know, they're not just you know doing everything they want. You know, there's not much responsibility when you're wearing old, dirty clothes, especially you know, when I was a little kid, one of my favorite things to do would be run through the sprinklers and I used to build dams and stuff in the dirt and I would always wear, you know, my dirty clothes. But when I put on something clean, some valuable, I have to be careful. No, I can't touch the dirt of this world. No, I'm sorry. It's only when I play. No, sorry. I'm in my clothes and I got to please my daddy. Yeah. I'm in my cl- I got and I got I'm going to church and I got to and I can remember one time when I got my good clothes dirty for a very very stupid reason and boy do I I, I remember that yes let's not go into that but anyway so this guy sees that and he says you know what it would take he's looking at this clean robe and he's looking at the clothes he has on he says you know what? I could accept God's righteousness I could but then I'd need to give up some stuff that I always used to do with my old buddies. I could accept God's righteousness, but I could surrender completely and let the king, the, the righteousness that the king provided, come over and take me and make me a new person. But I really like the stuff I used to do. Right. This is so hard. And he says, okay, you know what? <laughs> what am I worried about? The king invited me, right? Right? I mean, come on. The king invited me. Right? So anybody can come. Right? So I'm just going to go. You know, he's, he's my king. You know, he's my, he's my daddy. You know? So, and he is. He is. You know, but there's two, always two sides. There's, yes, he's our papa. He's our, he's our, um, he's our lord. He's our father. He's our, he's our, he's our husband. And he's our, but he's also our judge. He's also our yeah. king. We must, in order to have a good relationship, we must see both sides. Yeah. And so many people that say, yeah, he's my daddy, you know. He, you know, I don't give a beep about that person. Or I, I love that movie that uses, you know, honestly, this world is so wicked. I've been looking in this some things, and they talk about how many movies there's this, how wicked this generation. They have one movie, I forget, had 159 F-words in one movie and this is so much just penetrating our culture why is it important to refrain from bad movies because whether you like it or not those movies you see that you're it's in your mind you think about it you imagine the story you remember it and especially if it has words those words become a part of you the more you cake them in garbage in garbage out that's not in the bible but boy that sure is shown to be true you know what and so that's why we must remain clean so this guy's saying i'd like to give up you know maybe but i don't want to give up everything but you know he's my daddy so he'll understand you know what he doesn't mind i'm sure sure just one person goes up in their old clothes it won't be and so he goes he goes hey sister so-and-so note that he was at the wedding he was in church he did not he didn't just stay outside the pearly gates he went into the wedding he was in he was in, hey, hey, sister so-and-so, hey, brother so-and-so, how you doing? Isn't it a great wedding? Let's eat something. Let's do this and that, and I'm all ready to go. The king sent me this, but I just thought I'd wear this, put on any old thing, you know? And then they say, friend, what are you doing with that wedding garment? The king looks, and he says, friend, I can only imagine the anguish that was in that king's eyes to think that he had taken his own glory, taken his own blood, taken his own substance, his own glory to be able to provide a way for this man to come clean and he rejects the glory? He rejects something that was made free and available to him? He was so, Charles Spurgeon said, we are full and forget God, satisfied with earth. We are content to do without heaven. I do not want to be content with earth. I do not want to be satisfied. I do not. I hope I never get to the place when I can look out with my carnal eyes and see even on the most beautiful day and say, I'm satisfied. No, I want to see the part of the gates. I want to see my king. I don't want to be satisfied with a career, that whatever career I may have. I do not want to wake up one day. 
day and feel satisfied. I cannot wake up one day or be satisfied because the minute I'm satisfied with how I am is the moment I regress and we cannot be satisfied. That's right. I fear I was when I was preparing this sermon, I was like, oh God, what am I gonna oh oh God, I just don't know God how I and then he says, you know what? The only person that preached a sermon while he he or she was perfect was Jesus. You know what? The moment and you know, my mom my mom asked before we got it, so you feel ready? I said, I I'm never ready. And then she said, but he always is, is, yeah, he always is, is. I fear the day. I fear the day, you know, I believe the Lord's going to keep using me, and I fear the day. I fear the day. The greatest, one of the greatest revival in earth, revivals in earth history was Azusa Street, and it was led by one of the most humble men ever known, and he, each service, before he'd start, he would put, take a cardboard box and put it onto his head, and he would sit there under a cardboard box and say, God, what do you want to see? And when did Azusa end? The day he stopped putting the box on his head. We are, we are not supposed to go around and have boxes on our heads, but for him and God, that was something that he want, God had worked out with him. That was his way of saying, God, I surrender, I yield to you. The moment we take our box over our head, the moment we take on pride, the moment we lift up in ourselves, the moment we keep one earring. Yeah. Take heed if you think ye stand, lest ye fall. Amen. Yes, Lord. It's in Brock Resin and in Brock Resin and in Brock is in Brock Resin of Russian and in Brossage and a brought to the day, a ratun Russian of Rote and in Rangua and Raconur is in a brock and he brings in a brotity and he brock her ratado and Riti, Jun Brock Russian of Rote, Irocoto, Irashonor, Rakam Roste, Bacaro, Haraturi Shon of Rak, Icalon Rakanara, Badecoto. He has called a church to strive, to pursue, to pant after, to chase. When you study in the Greek and you see how David says, my soul yearns, it longs. It means he's not just, he doesn't think, yeah, I could use another piece of pie. It means I prefer a drink of water. I'm desperate for one drop. I'm desperate for one ounce of his glory. I'm desperate for that river. I'm desperate for that banquet. I'm desperate for his presence. I need him more than anything in my life. That is what he's talking about. And the, that what is what he called this church to be. Not a casual. We'll come here to have a little Sunday service and be happy and content with what we're doing. He doesn't, hasn't called this church to sit down in our pews and be satisfied where we are. He hasn't called us to be satisfied. He hasn't called us to just have a little church club. He's called us to seek after him more than any church. I'm just going to say that. He's called us to seek him more than any church because the church is dying. The church is falling asleep. And in the midst of this dark hour, he wants somebody. He wants a bride. He wants a church. He wants a people to come after him with all that they have. He wants a church that will settle for nothing else but then the full, total, absolute presence of God and nothing else. He wants a church that will desire nothing but the sweet honeycomb of his presence. Yes. He wants a church that will not settle yes. for one ounce belief what they can have. He wants a church that will strive, that will push, that will continue, that even when hell fire is burning at their feet, they will not fear because he is with them. He wants a church that when persecution comes, and no it's coming, but when persecution comes, they say, they, even if he would slay me, but he's not, he's always good, but even though this enemy try to slay me, this world try to put me down, yet will I praise him. If we come to the point where if they put us on the stake, or if they put us on the spot, or if we become a rare breed on this earth, we're rare, the minority, the air where everybody looks and say, oh, look, you're not one of those Christians, are you? Those radicals. He wants us to be prepared. He wants
wants us to stay hungry. He wants us to strive with all that we are. We must not rest content. We must not keep one earring. Not one. Not one. And it's so easy. One little earring. Yeah, I'll just concede. I'll just compromise right here. Just one place. The greatest man of the Bible fell because of compromise. David compromised when he should have gone out to battle. He was at home alone. When, when uh, Asa when Asa should have sought God, he sought an alliance. When Jehoshaphat should have sought God, he sought an alliance. When we rely on an arm of flesh or our checkbook, yeah. we take our allegiance away from God. Right. And it is such a slap in his face. It's, I would surrender all, but I surrender some. We joke, I surrender some. And that's always, always makes us all laugh. But in reality, most of the church is singing that in their hearts. Yeah. It's a sad joke because it's one of those jokes that are true. We're coming to a place where people just surrender some. They expect to come to this altar and surrender part of their hearts. Give him a half that they can live without. I'll give you this time that I can have some extra free time. I'll fit you into my busy schedule. And they expect somehow to receive all of him. How can I conclude but say, church, we cannot be satisfied with surrendering right. part. We, it's a continual, a continual chisel. We're always going to have problems, but we're always going to be moving from glory to glory. We cannot stop. There's a main stream, there's a river, there's a main stream of this current world that's streaming straight to hell. Yeah. And we must strive, we must push, we must swim because the current is going the opposite direction. We gotta swim up a waterfall because the moment we let up, the moment we say, God, I'm just so tired, God has not given us anything that we cannot endure. That's right. The moment we say, I'm tired, is the moment we fall. But God, I like to end with a but God, but God is there to raise you up. The moment you're not, str you're not strong enough, he's more than enough. The moment we say, God, I can't do this on my own, he says, you don't have to. You got my blood. You don't have to. You got my grace. You don't have to do it on your own. You have my provision. You don't have to do it on your own. You got my healing. You got it all. And that is how he comes in. He takes and everything. It costs nothing. We say, whoa, we can just surrender our all when he's given us all of him. Why not? Amen. I'm offering you the best deal. You've never seen anything like this on eBay. You've never seen anything like this on Amazon. No commercial. I'm off. God's offering you today a chance to give up your all for all of him. And all of us is so small. We're just a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. And he's so big. He's eternity. There's something about numbers. There can be a fraction. There can be zero. But there's eternity. Yeah. Oh, nobody. Can I? There's a proof. It is a proven fact that no one has ever counted to eternity. There. <laughs> Because you think he has this, but then he keeps on giving more. He said, God, I can't get any more of your presence. Oh, but there's more. He says, oh, I can't take any more of your joy. Oh, but there's more. Oh, I can't take any more of your healing. Oh, but there's more. <laughs> he says today, you think my right hand has been shortened? You think I'm running out of bread? You think I'm running out of ice cream? You think I'm running out of cake? I'm just getting started. You thought that was all a dinner? That was the appetizer. Oh, no, there's so much more. And God wants to give you so much more today yeah. just for the surrender. Yeah. And so today yeah. I'd like to ask if there's anything you'd like prayer for, if you want to just say, God, take on me. Why do we raise our hands? I surrender. I surrender. Here I am. I'm not fighting for the world anymore. I'm coming to your side. I'm switching allegiances. I'm coming. I'm coming. And if you want prayer for anything, and if you want to surrender more, or you just want another piece of cake, yeah. you can come up here and receive all, all I ask, all God asks is that you hunger and that you surrender and keep no earring. Yes, Lord. <sighs> yes, Lord. Jesus. Lord, I 
Arashanara, Arashadoka, Arashanara.